Earth has a surface area of almost 197 million square miles, and more than two-thirds of it is covered by water. To this day, a great majority of our oceans and seas remain vastly unexplored. We know more about the secrets and enigmas of the lunar surface than we do about the world's waters. For as long as there have been eyewitness reports of UFOs in our skies, there have been similar reports of so-called USOs, or unidentified submerged objects, in our oceans. A USO is a UFO that goes into or out of water. In fact, UFOs and USOs are probably the same things. A UFO becomes a USO when it's no longer flying and submerges. For the first time ever, explore the mysteries of this most elusive class of UFO. Be nice if the Navy would tell us about all their observations of such craft. It is definitely possible to have an underwater vehicle at supersonic speed. From reports that the lost city of Atlantis is a secret base for USOs. The legend of Atlantis is based on knowledge that such a base exists today. To an eyewitness account recorded in Christopher Columbus's journal in 1492. They saw it going up and down in the night. To the world's only government documented USO incident a dramatic event off the coast of Nova Scotia, Canada. On the night of October 4, 67, a UFO was seen to hover over the waters of Shag Harbor, tilted to a 45 degree angle, and descended rapidly to the water surface, producing a flash and the sound of an explosion. According to researchers, deep sea UFOs continue to lurk through the uncharted waters of Earth. Have UFOs visited our planet? Or are they already here? This is the Santa Catalina Channel, a 26-mile wide stretch of the Pacific Ocean separating the city of Los Angeles from Catalina Island. According to experts, these waters portions of which might be as deep as Mount Everest is high, may contain some of the world's darkest mysteries. You are seeing an unidentified flying object. It is not a hoax. It is real. The film was taken by Leland Hansen while filming Catalina Island from a helicopter. In recent years, escalating reports of unidentified submerged objects, or USOs, flying into and out of the channel have caused great concern to local residents and researchers. The whole area here is just a huge hotbed of UFO activity. I've uncovered probably two, three hundred cases of UFOs flying over the mountains and over the water here. It's just a huge hot spot. Preston Dennett is the author of UFOs Over California. He has been investigating USO activity in this area for almost 20 years. Actually, there was a huge wave of sightings over the Santa Monica mountain range on June 14, 1992. The witnesses counted a total of about 200 objects. What's interesting about this case is these objects came from below. Normally, when someone sees a UFO, it comes out of the sky like a star. They see a star-like object and it comes swooping down. These came from below to above. June 14, 1992. 10.24 p.m. For almost two minutes, the waters of the Pacific Ocean explode with light as hundreds of bright, disc-like craft are witnessed flying out of the water together. Similar to other reports of USOs exiting the water, these craft emerge from the Pacific in almost complete silence. They reportedly hover for a moment before bursting into space. Reports of this incident were phoned into local police departments as far away as Malibu. The following is an actual call that was placed on that day. Officer Sheriff, did anyone report anything strange tonight? Uh, maybe other than one specific. Uh, strange. Uh, Light. Light? Yes. What exactly uh, happened to you? I'm ashamed to tell you because I think you're going to think you're crazy. We saw 
Yeah. We thought it was a bright light up the sky. Okay. We could hear it. It wasn't a helicopter. I'm telling you, I have never been more frightened in my life. According to Dennett, the incident was also reported to the U.S. Coast Guard sector in Long Beach, which ultimately declined the search request. This 1992 event was the second in Los Angeles in three years. On the dark, foggy morning of February 7, 1989, scuba divers, boat sonar systems, and people on the shore witness a long, dark, unidentified craft dive out of the Pacific. For about 90 seconds, the USO rests just above the surface before emitting about a dozen smaller, fast-moving objects. 60 seconds later, the craft dives back underwater. Its last reported sonar heading was south toward the Santa Catalina Channel before it disappeared. And it involved dozens of objects which were seen off the coast of Marina del Rey. On occasion, some of these craft would emit smaller craft about 20 feet in diameter. And these were seen moving underneath the surface of the ocean and they were coming in and out of the water. As the 1947 incident at Roswell sparked worldwide curiosity about flying saucers, these events near Los Angeles have sparked a current wave of research into the capabilities and threats of so-called USOs. The oceans of the world cover, you know, 70% of the planet. They hide uh, a lot of history and a lot of mystery. There's a very good reason for a whole society of uh, creatures sentient creatures, advanced creatures living underwater because they can, because nobody goes there. It's fascinating to think of the underwater UFOs because they know a lot about this planet that you and I don't know. Unique to the USO phenomenon is the reported ability of these craft to multiply and break apart. One such astounding case has become known as the Golfo Nuevo event. On February 8, 1960, the Argentinian Navy is on alert as they track two unidentified submarine-like objects in its waters, thought to be American subs. Then, according to reports, the underwater objects are seen on sonar to break apart and fly out of the water. Sonar contact, 173, 438 yards. Bridge contact, sonar contact, 173, 438 yards. Two gigantic submarines sighted by the Argentinian Navy in 1960 inexplicably multiplied into six other submarine objects. The Argentinians were never able to catch them or destroy them because the objects simply disappeared. The case even caught the attention of the Soviet Union's most senior officials. Nikita Khrushchev, who was the leader of the Soviet Union at the time, was so much intrigued by the whole story that he sent his diplomatic attaché in Buenos Aires to find out what's been going on. While some researchers contend that these reported cases might be nothing more than military submarines firing torpedoes, others argue that submarines were not capable of firing six or more objects in 1960. Late USO researcher Ivan T. Sanderson's 1970 book, Invisible Residence, was the first to analyze the USO phenomenon. He reports on another remarkable example of USO behavior in March 1963, a U.S. Navy submarine exercise is progressing as planned 100 miles off Puerto Rico. Suddenly, one Navy sub abruptly breaks from its assigned route after picking up an unidentified object traveling at speeds in excess of 150 knots. The submarines are astonished by the depth at which the unidentified craft is moving, 20,000 feet underwater gave the acoustic signature of a single propeller uh, type of motion through the water and uh, it was tracked at depths down to 20,000 feet whereas a typical crush, crush depth for a submarine would be 7,000 feet. So this thing, whatever it was, was exceeding the technical capabilities of uh, submarines at that time and even today. The vessel is tracked for almost four days by the entire carrier group. The object would reportedly propel away at impossible speeds and then stop and rest, allowing for continued tracking by the Navy. Reports about this event were sent back to Sinclair Fleet Headquarters in Norfolk, Virginia. However, an official determination into what was seen on sonar that afternoon was never made. 
But according to reports, the Navy lost track of the craft after midnight on the fourth day. It was never picked up on sonar again. Nobody advanced a theory as to how something could move that fast. We have reports of USOs going into and out of the water, but we don't have any of the technical data. Flying saucers that are above the ground, people see them. But what's underwater, the Navy sees them. And the Navy isn't talking about what it's doing. Inflating an immense balloon aboard the USS Norton Sound, the Navy prepares for further study of the elusive cosmic rays somewhere in the Pacific. That's the news. A secondary consideration clears up the mystery of the so-called flying saucers. For it is these monsters which rise 19 miles and attain diameters of 100 feet that have been mistaken for the apparitions called flying saucers. At great altitudes, they tell us, these elongated enormities flatten out like plates. Mystery ended. But reports from around the world continue. Another extraordinary case is reported in the international press beginning on November 11th, 1972. A fast-moving submarine-like object is picked up on sonar in the Sonja Fjord off the west coast of Norway by the Norwegian Navy, which hunts it for two weeks. A fleet of surface ships and specially equipped sub-hunter helicopters are assembled to find the object. On November 20th, 1972, the USO is seen visually for the first time. It was described as being a massive, silent, cigar-shaped object. A Navy ship promptly fires its guns and torpedoes at the craft. Some ship actually saw it on the surface and fired at it, but it dived, and then they started dropping depth charges. Although all the articles treat this as a submarine, the fact of the matter is nobody was able to identify it as a submarine. After tracking the object for almost two weeks, the Navy devises and executes a plan to blockade the fjord and trap the USO. They tried to seal off this fjord so nothing could get in or out. Nevertheless, after 14 or 15 days, this thing disappeared. So that, that may mean that this object, whatever it was, it was tracked by the Navy, was not a submarine at all, but uh, an unidentified submerged object. Coming up, did Christopher Columbus and his crew witness USOs flying into and out of the Atlantic on October 11th, 1492? One of the earlier cases comes all the way back from the day before Columbus Day in 1492, before there was a Columbus Day. And it happened on the Santa Maria. October 11th, 1492, 10 p.m. A calm, clear night. Christopher Columbus and his crew move slowly across one of the deepest ravines of the Atlantic and through the Bermuda Triangle. Below them is almost four miles of water. Suddenly, unearthly lights are seen flashing across the bottom of the ocean. One of the earlier cases comes all the way back from the day before Columbus Day in 1492, before there was a Columbus Day. And it happened on the Santa Maria. This person's name was Gutierrez. And Gutierrez was on the Santa Maria with Christopher Columbus and noticed an object rising out of the water, a disc-shaped object. A great flash of light with a level of brilliance unlike anything known at the time suddenly erupts from the sea to the sky, startling Columbus and his crew of 120 aboard the three-ship Spanish fleet. In less than five hours, they would discover the new world. Christopher Columbus maintained a log in the ship. It describes what could be interpreted as a UFO event. They saw in the description given in, in the logbook the flickering of a wax candle going up and down in the night. It, it couldn't have been a campfire on ground because it was beyond the horizon. This possible USO incident is more than just legend and lore. For the first time ever, original text from Columbus's log has been made available to the History Channel by archivists at Fordham University custodian of a rare handwritten copy of the journal. The October 11, 1492 sighting was not an isolated occurrence. Over the two-month journey, 
Columbus's log exhibits a consistent pattern of cryptically reported peculiar incidents, including unexplained sightings and unusual events in outer space. The following is from an entry on September 10, 1492, the halfway point of the voyage. The crew of the Nina stated they had seen a garajo and a water wagtail, but these birds never go farther than 25 leagues from the land. From an entry September 11th, 1492. Saw a large fragment of the mast of a vessel, apparently of 120 tons, but could not pick it up. Entries on both September 17th and September 20th indicate that stars or other unidentified lights in the sky are seen to move. The cause was that the star moved from its place, but the needles remained stationary. And from the infamous entry of October 11th. The Admiral, at 10 o'clock that evening, standing on the quarterdeck, saw a light. Calling to Pero Guterres, he told him he saw a light and bid him look that way, which he did and saw it. The Admiral again perceived it once or twice, appearing like the light of a wax candle moving up and down. Is it possible that these strange events, recorded during the most fabled nautical journey in history, were the result of otherworldly vessels tracking Columbus's fleet? Some suggest, however, that any interpretations or rationalizations that might be gleaned from Columbus's log are not the whole truth. If Christopher Columbus saw a strange thing come out of the water, fly around his ship and then take off, would he have told anybody about it? They'd have locked him up in the brig instantly. The guy's crazy, because things can't do that. One of the earliest USO reports comes from 329 BC. After witnessing what he described as shining shield-like objects flying into and out of the Jaxartes River in India, Alexander the Great was so convinced that he witnessed otherworldly vessels, he spent the final six years of his life searching for evidence of these objects in a diving bell, believed to be the world's first submarine. Some conclude, however, that Alexander's underwater adventures had a greater goal, finding and conquering the one kingdom that had eluded him, Atlantis. Well, Atlantis first enters literary history in the philosophical dialogues of Plato. These are the Timaeus and the Critias. The gods, bothered by the attitude of the Atlanteans, decided to destroy Atlantis. In one day and one night, they destroyed it with a cataclysm, and it sank. To this day, researchers continue to speculate about Atlantis as a hub of USO activity. The legend of Atlantis definitely is based on knowledge, probably lost by today, of some secret underwater civilization. Atlantis's supposed location in the Mediterranean would have provided USOs a convenient position from which to monitor human civilizations and their shipping routes to and from Asia Minor, Rome, and Athens. The Mediterranean was the cradle of ancient civilization. The Phoenician traders traveled back and forth between the Middle East and Greece across the Mediterranean. If there were a culture of either aliens or original inhabitants of planet Earth who wanted to seed the planet, to seed humanity with myth, the Mediterranean is a natural base for them to set up an underwater facility. Well, I don't know if Plato was talking about unidentified submerged objects when he came up with Atlantis, but I suppose there are people who, uh, number one, assume that Atlantis is real, number two, that it's somewhere in the Atlantic, Number three, this buried in their thousands of feet of water. The ancient Athenians, however, were not the first to record stories of unidentified objects in the oceans. Experts believe the ancient Egyptians may have even recorded sightings in their hieroglyphic drawings. In ancient Egypt, in the temple at the city of Abydos, uh, somebody made an inscription, a depiction of a submarine. There was another depiction of an object that looks like a helicopter. Who made it? How did the ancient Egyptians know about it? We have no idea. One of the
of the earliest European cases is a series of reported English sightings in the 11th century. One of the oldest cases I have on the site goes back to the year 1067. It has to do with um, this people in the countryside seeing something flaming in the sky that came down to earth, lit up the countryside, and then went up again, and then into the sea. Carl Feint has been researching USO phenomenon for almost a decade. His internet site, waterufo.net, has an archive of over 900 current and historic USO reports. According to Feint, one of the 20th century's first cases was reported in detail in the Philadelphia Inquirer on August 1st, 1904. A British cargo ship, the Mohican, en route to Philadelphia was, according to the paper, enshrouded in a strange metallic vapor which glowed like phosphorus. I have found out recently that that case is a heck of a lot more detailed and scary than originally shown. The captain and the crew confirmed that an object came across the ocean, a cloud, approached the ship and it was glowing. Not a meteor, going straight down, it's coming across the sea. As it came towards the ship, the captain was trying to distract the crew to get them to do something different, you know, and get the, over the fear. They couldn't move anything while the cloud was around the ship. The Inquirer further reports that during the event, the ship's compass revolved with the speed of an electric motor, and the sailors were unable to raise pieces of steel from the magnetized decks. The story goes on to quote the Mohican's Captain Urquhart, who confirms that the account is vouched for by every man of the crew. But perhaps the most astounding USO-related event, according to experts, is a Canadian case from 1967. The Shag Harbor case is the most important USO case in documentation. The UFO moved underwater to a different point. A second UFO joined it. Coming up, we visit Shag Harbor, Nova Scotia on the 38th anniversary of this crucial USO incident. On October the 4th, 1967, that's where the light was right behind me on the water. Thirty-eight years ago today, October 4th, 1967, approximately 20 after 11 in the evening, Something happened in Shag Harbor that uh, became uh, quite memorable in later years. The night of October 4, 67 has become known as the uh, night of the UFOs among many UFO researchers. The Shag Harbor incident has become the best known aspect of that night. Chris Stiles and Don Ledger have spent the past decade researching the 1967 Shag Harbor USO incident. The case, widely reported throughout Canada at the time, had been largely forgotten in subsequent years. Their 2001 book, Dark Object, reopened the case, shedding new light on the many reported USO events of that night and the weeks following. The reason that the Shag Harbor incident came to the forefront and kind of eclipsed the importance of the other sightings from the night of the UFOs is simply the fact that it's the one case where something came down out of the sky and crashed into the water. You know, it made a noise, it made a flash. It's also unique in the sense that nobody reported a UFO. Several calls came in very quickly to the nearby Royal Canadian Mounted Police Detachment, and those reports said simply that people had seen lights or perhaps an aircraft had crashed into the waters of what they called the sound. The interest and the concern was totally for the possibility of survivors. Nobody reported the UFO. I'm not surprised now that I had seen uh, something in the sky that night because all over Nova Scotia, the night uh, of the Shag Harbor incident, there were many, many, many UFO reports. Just up around the bend, we'll be coming into Shag Harbor and the site crowd gathered and watched uh, whatever it was that happened here 38 years ago today. Each year, Ledger and Stiles make an anniversary trip to Shag Harbor to meet with Norm Smith, one of only three surviving witnesses. See the oil on out there? That's, that's where it all took place, right off that. That's where we've seen the light in the water. Hey, sir. How you been? Good. 
Same old, same old. Same old. Same old. <laughs> the three of us stood on the lawn watching the lights. Eventually it started going, it looked like it was moving to us, and then on the downward slope towards the ground, uh, we thought it was a plane crash. So we jumped in the vehicle in my old man's car and, and uh, my uncle's, and we went up to this spot right here by the old the Irish Moss plant. And when we got here, the, there was uh, probably 10, 12 other people. We watched the lights on the water for a period of two or three minutes, and then the lights disappeared. What happens next is indisputable. Before midnight on Wednesday, October 4th, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police officers who witnessed the event from the shoreline searched the water on boats until 3 a.m. with the help of several local fishermen, including Norm Smith. At noon on Friday, October 6th, Canadian Navy divers from Halifax arrive and search the area through the weekend. Eventually, seven divers were dispatched from the fleet diving unit in Halifax and taken down to Shag Harbor. The search effort continued through all the daylight hours of Saturday and Sunday, and by Monday morning that search was officially terminated in Ottawa, and they just simply say unidentified flying object and circle it and underline it. According to government reports, the object travels from the south to the north along the Nova Scotia shoreline. At one point, it stops and hovers. Then at approximately 11.20 p.m., it enters the water at a 45 degree angle, 300 yards offshore. Directly behind me where we've seen the lights, right, right at Bomb Portage Island, directly behind me. When the Royal Canadian Mounted Police officers that had responded to the call arrived at the shoreline of Old Highway Number 3, the UFO was still moving upon the surface of the water. The object also appeared to be leaving a trail of dense yellow foam. In the weeks following October 4th, the story becomes even more mysterious. The case is front page news across Canada. And as Ledger and Stiles report in their book, in the days just prior to the Canadian military's official classification of this incident as a UFO event, a second craft enters the waters of Nova Scotia to rendezvous with the first craft. And then this thing resumed its uh, headway back down this way at about 4,400 miles an hour and came down uh, through northern New Brunswick, right down over the Bay of Fundy, across the southwestern tip of Nova Scotia, across this way, and went down in the water here. Authorities already knew the object was no longer there, that it had moved under the water and had come to rest on the seabed. It sat there for almost a week, right to the hour. And after that time, it began moving under the water to the Gulf of Maine with the aid of a second craft that was helping to repair it. And the two of them broke the surface of the water and flew away out over the Gulf of Maine. Interestingly enough, there is a second report of a sighting, one week in Shag Harbor, of two sets of lights, one orange, one yellow, leaving the water and flying away. This case continues to inspire debate and continued research into the events of October 4th, 1967. There are a large amount of primary documents that support interpreting Shag Harbor as a crash scenario of the UFO. And in one of the paragraphs, it actually says a preliminary investigation has been conducted, and it has been discovered that this object is not the result of a flare, float, downed aircraft, or in fact, any known object. I didn't, you know, I didn't know then, back 30 odd years ago, I didn't know whether it was a UFO or, or what it was. But. Nobody will ever make me believe that there was nothing there because it was. Coming up, seen for the first time, video evidence of what might possibly be a USO emerging from the waters of Laguna Cartagena in Puerto Rico. And they are coming towards Laguna Cartagena. And later, a University of California scientist reveals that supersonic speed by deep sea UFOs is not only scientifically possible, but likely. A region with perhaps the longest legacy of USO activity is the area around Puerto Rico. As the mysterious southern point of the Bermuda Triangle, the island has been at the center of USO debate for decades. Puerto Rico is a hot spot for underwater UFO activity, and it seems to match the pattern of other cases. Puerto Rico is considered in all of the Americas to be the place where there's the greatest number of USO sightings. Members of the Puerto Rican-based ufology group, Project Argus, 
agreed to lead a tour of some of the island's more notable USO-related areas. Laguna Cartagena is an isolated lake near the southwestern corner of the island. It has become linked to much of Puerto Rico's reported USO activity. I have been conducting investigations for years in Laguna Cartagena, where there's also a lot of secrecy about USOs. Laguna Cartagena since 1930 has been a place where hundreds of cases were reported of flying objects coming and going from the area. October 8, 2002, approximately 9 p.m., Puerto Rican police officer and Project Argus member Carlos Torres witnesses a red glowing USO fly out of the waters of Laguna Cartagena at an incredible speed. Then it stops and hovers just above the water. I was a witness of an object suspended over Laguna Cartagena. The military got involved because they were also witnesses. The object flew away and then back from Monte Indi. And it stopped and hovered over Laguna Cartagena. After hovering for several minutes over the area, the object was seen to crash back into the lake. Another Argus member, Giuseppe Quinones, believes he captured the same object on videotape in 2004. I took a video on November 20th, 2004 in the immediate area of Laguna Cartagena. Seen for the first time, possible video evidence of a USO near this enigmatic lake. The brightly lit, craft-like object was seen emerging from the water. Here, it hovers for almost one minute before flying away. In the mid-1990s, several attempts to disprove the USO activities were made despite hundreds of witnesses that said they saw lights going in and coming out of the water. They have been seen all over Puerto Rico. Specifically, the most mentioned places are Laguna Cartagena and Route 303. The region of Lajas, through which Route 303 runs, has been another source of significant USO and UFO reports including a possible 1997 crash on Monte Indio that left behind a scorched earth impact zone and many unanswered questions. In May 5, 1997, a, 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 a UFO crashed there, burned many lands on the, on the top of the mountains, and there was feathers that night, and they obtained something that we don't know. After this 1997 incident, local government officials began to take USO and UFO reports more seriously. As a direct result, the mayor of Lajas, Puerto Rico, recently designated the roadway through the heart of Puerto Rico's UFO country as UFO Route 303. But for now, other USO-related events around the island are far more pressing for experts. In the hills around Lajas, a mysterious government aerostat, a tethered balloon-borne radar, is frequently launched up to three miles in the air, ostensibly to monitor air traffic and weather. However, USO researchers believe the balloon's real function is actually covert, to observe and record UFO and USO activity. There is a government document in the legislature where a secret investigation was conducted. Not public, but secret, about the USO events in the waters. But the document states that they do not pose any danger to humanity. The volume of USO reports from around this small island have prompted many to speculate that the deep waters directly below the southern tip of the Bermuda Triangle, just offshore, conceal more than USOs. Experts and researchers from around the world believe they possibly obscure a major USO base as well. It is suspected that there's a base between La Paguera in an area near Cabo Rojo. It is also supposedly very deep and cavernous and it goes as far as Laguna Cartagena. 
El motivo de entrar y salir. The motive for them coming in and out of the water is so that they are able to enter in one area and come out in a different area in the underwater basins. Could all of these events simply be tied to local mysticism or perhaps the cultural sway of the Bermuda Triangle? In Puerto Rican culture, the majority of the people here, even though they talk about the Chupacabra and the Bermuda Triangle, they do not believe in any of this. Or is there possibly something more? It's a reality. The USOs in Puerto Rico are real. There are hundreds of testimonies and witnesses. It's all real. I think that the UFO phenomenon is real. Here in Puerto Rico, there have been hundreds of cases. That is a reality. Coming up, possible photographic evidence of a USO exiting the waters of Gulf Breeze, Florida. It is believed that unidentified submerged objects are able to move through our oceans and seas in ways that defy all principles of modern physics. Experts are confounded by the ability of these vessels to reportedly travel at extreme depths, pass through ice with impunity, and traverse water at supersonic speed. These kinds of craft ostensibly can travel underneath the water because they are impervious to water, just like they're impervious to gamma rays, cosmic rays, impervious to anything that gets in the way of their traveling in space. According to all information, we are dealing with a very advanced technology. They circle ships and next thing you know, dive into the water. It's, it's, it's not a barrier to them. They just go from one medium to another. In late 1969, while conducting their regular Operation Deep Freeze icebreaking exercises near Antarctica, U.S. Navy sailors aboard the USS Calcaterra reportedly witness an unidentified submerged object with some extraordinary capabilities. Ivan Sanderson in Argosy magazine where he talks about an event somewhere in the Arctic when an object came up through the ice and took off, uh, really sort of burled its way through. A large submarine-shaped object at least 100 feet long is seen bursting out of the frozen ocean through several yards of solid ice at an incredible speed. But this case, however, is only one of many similar incidents reported by navies around the world. I know of one case that occurred near Leningrad. In the winter in 1976, a USL broke down through the ice, maneuvered underwater, and then again broke back out through the ice. They do melt ice. Now, if you had a meteor, the dynamics of the thing would break the ice into chunks and scatter them all over the place. With the UFO, it's a clean hole. USO witnesses have also reported seeing water spouts beneath USOs as they exit the water including Ed Walters, a resident of Gulf Breeze, Florida, who snapped this never-before-seen Polaroid picture of what appears to be a USO above a tornado-shaped water spout on July 7, 1988. So he was looking north towards Gulf Breeze across the Santa Rosa Sound, a distance of about 7,000 feet. He noticed that the water down beneath the object started to get all foamy or something. You could see it dancing around, and all of a sudden this column of water went up and contacted the bottom of it. The picture that he took actually shows that. Such cases have caused some experts to assert that USOs might possibly use water as a fuel source. There are those who feel that water is essential for the fusion process. There are a lot of cases where UFOs hover over reservoirs and small bodies of water, not only large bodies of water. It does seem to be some evidence that they can use water to help their craft in some way. They may use water as a fuel. Uh, when these cases where they talk about objects hovering over the water and seeming to suck water up in, certainly sounds like uh, they need a big drink or something to keep, keep going. Modern scientific theories abound about how USOs develop the ability to propel themselves through water with great efficiency. Researchers envision everything from massive jet-like propulsion systems to frictionless bubbles that cocoon the objects. So the engines wouldn't be engines as you and I would imagine engines. They would be generators 
generating a magnetic force, creating a magnetic envelope around the craft that repels the Earth's natural magnetism, hence allowing them to accelerate, decelerate, climb, fall, and navigate through the water. By exerting forces at the surrounding fluid, seawater, nice electrically conducting fluid, you control the drag, you control the flow, the speed, the lift, you can get around all the problems of high-speed motion under the water. A magneto-aerodynamic system would work similar to the electromagnetic submarine that was successfully tested. An electromagnetic submarine was in fact built and tested by the University of California, Santa Barbara in the mid-1960s. It took advantage of saltwater's natural ability to conduct electricity. The first successful test of an electromagnetic propulsion system was conducted on Earth in 1966, when this electromagnetic submarine was first demonstrated. This electromagnetic submarine moves through the water as a result of electromagnetic forces. It has absolutely no moving parts. The principle here is that seawater is an electrically conducting fluid. You push against the seawater by Newton's laws, elementary physics, it pushes back, and off you go. Is it possible that USOs take advantage of this natural capability of our oceans to reach supersonic speed? Water is a great magnetic conduit. In fact, if they were traveling using a process called diamagnetism, which is a weak repellent force, then water would enhance that force which would explain why these craft are able to navigate in water so well. One researcher theorizes that USOs might move rapidly through the water and avoid catastrophic damage using the same principles as a common light bulb. UFO is the filament in this particular case, and the bulb is the field, and that protects the UFO. It keeps the water from coming onto it when it goes in. They move it, though, and it never touches the UFO and that uh, can be achieved by creating so-called super cavitating bubble around the whole object. In that way, a uh, whole object travels together with a bubble of water vapor. Marco Princevac is a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of California, Riverside. He devised an experiment for the History Channel demonstrating the physics behind possible supersonic movement through the water. Basically, the only thing that you can play with is the shape of a vehicle. And it, 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 it will deviate from the standard shapes of a submarine. To demonstrate how different shapes can produce the conditions for supersonic underwater travel, Princevac and his team force an underwater current, along with green dye and high-powered lasers, around different submersed objects. So if we have something called a streamlined body, we see that fluid uh, flows undisturbedly around that uh, body. This red streamlined object represents the perfect shape for a fast-moving underwater vessel. In direct contrast, the cube that is tested creates massive resistance all around the object. A good uh, shape for an underwater supercavitating vehicle would be something similar to a return capsule of uh, Soyuz or other space missions. The laws of earthly physics change dramatically underwater. Propelling an oceanic vehicle to supersonic speeds requires an amount of power greater than what man has currently invented. A vehicle that has a five-foot diameter and we want to go at the speed of sound in, in the air, we would need an engine that can produce 15,000 horsepower. For the same vehicle to reach the speed of sound under the water, we would need an engine that can produce around one million horsepower. While it might be scientifically possible for USOs to prowl the oceans at supersonic speed, how have these craft developed the technology required to achieve this milestone? The many mysteries of these craft may never be fully understood. And that is exactly what provokes the greatest debate and distress among investigators and researchers. I think it's easier for us to land a man on the moon or even create a moon base than to land a man on the bottom of the ocean. If they're hostile and have come here to conquer Earth, they would have done it a million years ago. 
we might be their creations for all we know. The Earth is conquered, we work for them, they live here, this is their planet.